in um, the modern kosher kitchen. I have one with lamb. And on my website, I have one with cheese. Uh, Shakshuk is uh, a very versatile recipe. So today I'm making one with what that I call East Indian. And the thing that makes it East Indian is the curry flavor and the hot pepper. So I wanna show you the ingredients. I have prepared some of them because I'm sure you know how to chop up a tomato. If um, one time I said this in one of my Zoom classes and I said, I'm sure you know how to chop up an onion. And so I went ahead with my procedure and at the end of it, somebody said, they were, it was a young group. Somebody said, no, I don't know how to chop up an onion. So if anybody would like me to do that later, I certainly will, I have the onion. Anyway, shakshuka, my recipe, I sent the recipe to everybody, I think. We have an onion and I said a red bell pepper. I happen to use an orange one for this because I got a three pack and I think it looks good. Um, you can use an orange pepper and certainly you could use a green pepper. Shakshuka sometimes is made with canned tomatoes and very often when I have shakshuka in a restaurant, it's, it's like tomato sauce. Uh, crushed tomatoes, canned tomato marinara sauce. I like it chunky, so I always make it with um, a fresh tomato, except when I don't have them. If you don't have fresh tomatoes, you can certainly use drained, canned, Italian-style Roma tomatoes. So I make mine with Roma tomatoes, that's these, you know, the long ones. The reason I use these tomatoes is because they have less water. So they're less likely to have a liquidy kind of surface. Um, I say in my recipe to use six, but, and I'm not shopping for myself these days. I'm relying on Instacart. And my Instacart shopper gave me what I call gesunde tomatoes. These are the largest I've ever seen. So I didn't actually cut up uh, uh, six of them, um, or no, eight. I cut up six. And I think it's going to be enough. But this is, as I said, a versatile recipe. If you don't have eight tomatoes, you only have regular tomatoes, that's okay. If you uh, have a little of each, that's okay. Just cut up your tomatoes. I have a tomato knife with a serrated edge. I don't like to use serrated edge knives. And by the way, I usually give knife instructions when I'm giving a cooking class. So um, I hope you don't mind. Serrated knives are not for meat, even if some companies sell them as meat knives. Tomato knives are, um, serrated knives are for bread or vegetables like tomatoes. So you just wanna cut this and I'm gonna add them to the tomatoes I've already cut. When I say chunks, we want pieces about this size. Can you see it? So I'm just gonna add them to my batch. And your onion. I also ask for a chili pepper. I think I said habanero, serrano, or other small pepper. This one is also a very large pepper, so I only used one. I cut it up. What you do, you cut the top off. You cut this down the middle and all the seeds inside must get discarded. I've already done that, so I don't have to chop this for you. And use your judgment. If it's a very large pepper like this, use one. If you like things spicy, use two. If you don't like things spicy, don't use any. You could throw in, if you want just a hint of a spice, throw in a little cayenne pepper at the end. Garlic. I like to use these fresh garlic cloves. I sometimes buy the garlic that's already peeled, but not cut. Somehow I'm not able to buy them during the pandemic. So I use fresh garlic, one clove, take the flat of your knife. Can everybody see what I'm doing? Can you see? Pounce down on it. 
and the garlic comes out whole. I never cut garlic ahead of time and I don't buy already cut garlic because once you cut the garlic, all of the vapors and the flavor start to dissipate immediately. And if you leave garlic too long, you're just gonna get the smell, you're not gonna get the flavor of the garlic. So chopping garlic, like anything, chop it into slices and then into strips. And then you can make little pieces out of it. If you can get the already peeled garlic, that's fine. I do not recommend the peeled and crushed garlic that's uh, in, I think it's in olive oil or something. So that's a side. The other thing that I don't like to peel ahead of time is fresh ginger. This isn't a usual ingredient in shakshuka, but this is uh, ginger that's used very often in Asian cooking and Indian cooking, you know, West Asian cooking. And I buy a lot of it because I like to peel it and use it, uh, steep it in, in hot water uh, for like a tea. It's very relaxing. And I think Andrew Weil, uh, the famous doctor, wrote that if you're feeling bad or if you have, you know, you're covering from some disease or other, uh, steeping fresh ginger in boiling water, and he adds honey, I don't, um, let it steep for a few minutes and then drink it. It's very relaxing. Like garlic, don't cut ginger too quickly before you're going to cook because the flavor and the, few, the, the vapors dissipate. So we need about two teaspoons of ginger. Once again, cut some slices. Then cut the slices and then turn the slices around. This is not something where, um, unless you're feeling very, very um, like, like a novice, which I don't think anybody on here is, you don't have to measure. You can more or less tell what two teaspoons of ginger is like. Ginger lasts a long time. A lot of people have methods for steeping it and, and uh, freezing it. I just wrap it. I read recently that the best way to keep fresh vegetables is to keep them in um, paper, just like this. Rinse them off, dry them, and then wrap them in paper towels and they keep a little better. Um, I just started doing that, so I'm not sure if it's true, but anyway, this is about two teaspoons worth. So now we have our tomatoes. I've cut up the bell pepper and the chili pepper. I've cut up the onion. All about the same size. I learned in Chinese cooking school, I took Chinese cooking lessons many, many years ago, and I learned that if you want foods to cook evenly and properly, you should cut them about the same size if they're going to be cooking for the same amount of time. And I have my handy little cooktop that I bought, I think 40, 40 years ago. This is butane cooking. So some of the things I cook on here, the heat isn't as good as regular cooktop. So it may take a little longer. Need a big pan for shack sugar. And Going to cover the bottom of the pan. That's about four tablespoons. I never measure. It's you just want to cover the bottom and and have enough for the vegetables not to stick. This happens to be non-stick, but the oil gives it a richness. 
So that's about a quarter. Before you add your vegetables, you want to make sure that the oil is hot, whatever you're cooking. Um, the last thing I want to show you is eggs, which I left in the fridge. I don't like to take those out. It used to be the rule that in kosher cooking, you have to um, crack the eggs one at a time. And I think in my directions, I say, keep crack the eggs one at a time before you put them on. It's no longer the rule because of the way that eggs are farmed and prepared these days. But um, I like to crack the eggs one at a time anyway, because I heard a story from one of my friends who was doing a uh, angel food cake, which takes a lot of eggs or some kind of cake, which took 12 eggs and she put all 11 eggs into her batter and then cracked the last one in and the last one was spoiled. So she had to throw out the whole cake because of the spoiled egg. So it's always a good idea, kosher or not kosher, whatever the rule is to always crack your eggs uh, uh, one at a time before you put them in the pan. So this feels a little hot. First thing we're gonna do is add the onion. I've made this, I'm never out of onions, but um, sometimes I'm running a little low on onion. So I've made this with scallion. The thing about a dish like this, like soup, if you don't have one thing, use another thing. And the essence of good cooking is learning how to substitute. When I was writing for the New Canaan Advertiser, I once had somebody ask me uh, if uh, for substituting the recipe, uh, the recipe called for vanilla. And she asked if I could, if she could substitute mustard. Now, you know, no, but I mean, it's, it's okay to ask. Obviously there are some substitutes that are not going to work. You would not use mustard in vanilla ice cream. You would use vanilla. But when it comes to similar products, like can I use a red onion? Can I use uh, a scallion? Can I use uh, a white onion? Yes. It'll taste a little different than you made it the time before, but yes. Most of the time when you're sauteing something, you the onion comes first because it flavors the oil and that flavors everything. So next on the agenda, we're going to add the chili pepper and I used yellow pepper as I mentioned. Can you see my messages coming in with those beats? <laughs> now, on your stove, on your cooktop, this will be sizzling. As I mentioned before, butane cooking is, is, uh, is not as good, but I wasn't able to set up my kitchen uh, with my gas cooktop, so this will have to do. When I have people here, when I teach, you know, not during the pandemic, they stand where I am and my cooktop is over there. Okay, we're going to add the garlic that I cut up and the ginger. You can't smell this, but I can tell you it already smells very good. And the tomatoes. If you like a more pureed traditional shakshuka, you can puree this uh, uh, sauce when it's cooked, but I want to recommend that you try it this way first. Also, if you don't, I know shakshuka always has eggs. If you don't want to eat eggs, you just want to have this vegetable mixture. You can put this on top of rice or pasta and it's a nice vegetarian dish. It's like ratatouille. Um, you can see also that the yellow pepper 
makes a nice color contrast with this. And if you had used scallion, you'd get the green from the scallion. Sometimes I add chives if I happen to have them. I couldn't get them this time. Okay, so we want to cook this for about 10 minutes after we add the seasoning. This is what makes this shakshuka a little different. This is curry powder. There's all kinds of curry powder. Curry powder just means a mixture of ingredients like zaatar is basically one thing, but people or daka um, and the seasoned salt, they're all just blends. And so you should really try to find a curry powder that you like to you make your own. I happen to like Penzi's spices and they have a stormy in here. So this happens to be sweet curry powder. Um, if I didn't have the um, uh, chili pepper, I would use hot curry powder. We want about two teaspoons of curry powder to give it that East Indian flavor. And salt, I never like to say how much salt because you know everybody's a little different. I'm gonna add about maybe a quarter, half a teaspoon, not much. Tomatoes have natural salt. You can let this cook. Mix it all up. Anybody has questions, this is a good time while we're waiting for this. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this aside because this has to cook about 10 minutes. And it will be right here in front of me so I can stir while we do dessert. When you're cooking, in my first book ever, I talked about cooking using a railroad table, meaning various trains start off in different places and they want to get to Grand Central Terminal at the same time, but they all have to leave at a different time because where they're coming from is different. It's the same with cooking. You don't usually cook one thing and then do the next thing and then do the next thing. You do some part of something and then you start another part of something so that everything comes out in time. If you're a new cook, it's a smart thing to write down the times that are needed so you know when to start each thing. But right now, instead of waiting and my yakking at you, um, we can actually start the dessert. Does anybody have the dessert recipe? Okay. Dessert, this came about, this dessert came about, this is pears with oat crumbles. This dessert came about, um, I, I made it with peaches. I couldn't get peaches, so I bought nectarines. And the nectarines were not free stone. I wanted to grill the nectarines that meant cutting the nectarine in half and ripping out the stone, but they weren't free stone. So I was left with fruit that I had to carve off the bone, so to speak. So instead of grilling them, I roasted them. So this recipe came about because of just a fault in the shopping. I didn't buy the right fruit. And then I realized that oat crumbles that I put on top of it were so good that I could use them for other fruit because I don't like to buy things like peaches and nectarines in the winter. I don't think they taste good. So we're gonna do it with pears. Pears are seasonal. And so we're gonna make um, roasted pears. The roasted pear recipe that I gave you, you could eat on its own. 
uh, sometimes I've made that. I serve it with ice cream or, or sorbet or, um, you know, non-dairy ice cream, whatever your meal uh, requires. Um, you can make this with baked apple, but we're gonna make it with pear. The reason I suggest a Bartlett pear, a Bartlett pear has a lot of flavor. You can always find them. Um, I think they have more flavor than orangey pears, but they're also sturdy. My favorite pear is a camise, but camise sometimes are too buttery and they fall apart and they're very expensive. So I like to just eat them as is. So I recommend a Bartlett pear. And probably all of you know by now that when you buy pears, I bought these last week and they're just ripening. Pears are removed from a tree when they're still hard and green because they get very bruised in transit. And when they're hard and green and not ripe, they don't get as bruised. So they send them to the market green. Most of the time we buy them when they're green and you have to let them sit out for at least four days. I kept these in my fridge because I wasn't sure you know, how long it would take. I see there are so, still some brown spots on it, but these are about right. Um, if you like boss pears, the, the, those are okay. I don't happen to like the texture of them. Um, or you could use the little pears, in which case, sir, uh, for this recipe, you get one half a pear per person. Uh, but if you get the little pears, I, uh, I forget what the name is, lady apple maybe, um, serve one, one whole pear per person. So we just want to peel the pear. Now I can see that some of this is already bruised. I'm going to show you what to do if your pears are not perfect and you want to serve them to company like this one. Pears, like apples, get brown quickly. So you have to rub the surface with uh, lemon juice. So here's the whole pear. Everything that, by the way, everything when you're buying a pear and you're taking it home in your bag, everything that it touches is going to get the bruise. I don't know if you can see it. So take a half a lemon, rub the surface so that this part doesn't get brown. And cut it in half. Whoops, my hand is wet. <clears throat> now, I have a melon baller, which I find very handy. Just stirring the chef shooter. I use a melon baller, but if you don't have a melon baller, you can use a teaspoon to scoop out the center seeds. Look how easily that came out. And for the end, you're gonna to have to use a paring knife and cut out the stringy part that comes from the center. So you're left with something like this. Put some lemon juice on it. Do the same thing with the second pair. I'm only using one pair today. I know the recipe says to use more, but now that I don't have actual people here, I don't like to make a full recipe because there's too much food. Anyway, cover the surface with lemon juice and we're good. Put them in a tray that can handle them without it, they're falling down. However, if they keep wobbling around, take a little piece off the bottom to make a flat surface, and then they will never fall. So you could do anything and they're gonna be okay.
the juice that we put on the pear or the peaches, whatever you're using, you could use plain orange juice. You could use whatever you use on, um, uh, on a baked apple. But today, I'm gonna to use coconut oil. I'm at the bottom of my coconut oil. I'm gonna melt some coconut oil. You could use butter. You know, um, if you're kosher and you need parv, um, coconut oil, re uh, refined coconut oil has come into use and it's a really good substitute for butter. You can't use it completely for butter because it's an overwhelming flavor, but you can mix it with margarine or in this case, there's so little in the recipe, um, I think one and a half tablespoons, it's barely anything. And I'm gonna add some maple syrup and some orange juice. I already measured out my orange juice. So this is the coconut oil that's melted. I'm gonna add some maple syrup, about two tablespoons. And one teaspoon of vanilla extract. This is um, Penzi's double strength vanilla extract. So I use a little less than, a little more than half. And orange juice. This is the syrup that you use to baste pears. Now I'm only baking one pear. This is enough for three large, maybe four medium. So I'm only gonna spill a little bit on top. And you wanna bake these about 25 to 30 minutes. Turn them over once, baste them with a, like a, a, a basting kind of tool or with a spoon, just like you would with baked apples. Put them in the oven. And while they're baking, we're going to make the oat crumbles. This is like a um, like an apple crisp kind of crumble. Um, but also it's like granola. I have had leftover of this particular crumble and I put it on yogurt um, in the morning, sometimes with strawberries. It's, it's a really good crumble. Okay, so we need, everybody with me? Okay, we need three quarters of a cup of flour, all purpose flour. Just gonna melt some butter while we're cooking. These I usually use real butter, but uh, you could use margarine or half margarine, half coconut oil. And let the butter melt while we do the rest. So that's three quarters of a cup of flour, half cup of toasted almonds. You don't have toasted almonds, but you have regular chop, or ch chopped. Um, if you don't have toasted almonds, but you have regular almonds, that's okay. If you don't like almonds and you like walnuts or you like something else, that's okay too. Put 
coats. I love Bob's Red Mill Quick Coats. By the way, somebody got me these when I'm not using my stasher bags because this has too much for the, even the largest stasher bag. I, I keep it in the bag and I use these clips to cover it. Um, so we need a half a cup of quick oats. This is a lot of crumbles. And a third of a cup of brown sugar. A lot of people ask me how I keep brown sugar soft. Somebody once told me a secret. I buy <clears throat> brown sugar by like a seven pound bag from Costco because I cook a lot. <clears throat> and I use one of these bricks kind of things. Every once in a while, I soak it again so that it's moist. I keep it in the brown sugar, it never gets hard. So we need about a third of a cup of brown sugar. Brown sugar, of course, you always pat down. Once again, some salt, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon. So this is your mixture. Mix this up. Meanwhile, your pears are baking. Set your timer halfway through so that you can baste, or a third of the way through so that you can baste a few times. And you can make this while your um, pears are baking, or you can make this ahead of time, as I did. And I melted one stick of butter. Just pour that right in. Ronnie, can you hear me? It's Connie. Yeah. I have a question. This is from Lorraine. She wants to know um, if you are, well, two things related. If you're using powdered vanilla, do you know how to substitute if the recipe at, uh, calls for vanilla extract? For powdered vanilla? Yeah. I don't know the, I don't know it now, but I, I could find it and let you know. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't use that, okay. but I've used vanilla paste. Okay. Um, anyway, mix all of your ingredients until you see that they're all coated with uh, butter. Mm -hmm. it smells good too. Mm. And one other quick question. If you're making yeah. the crumble, if you want to make the crumble for Passover, what would you substitute for the flour and the oats? I wouldn't. This is <laughs> not a Passover. I... <laughs> right. Okay. This is, not a... this is this is an oat crumble, and and it's you know I could tell you to use matzo meal. It, it, you could do a crumble with you know, and I'm sure I have some on my website, but not this. Okay. <laughs> Save this for like right after Passover when you want to have pumpkins. <laughs> um, okay, so take this and put it in a rimmed pan. Can you see? Yeah. All right, and make sure the crumbles are sort of separated and in a single layer. Now, I made some last night, so I would have it uh, ready for today without you having to wait. And I see that my recipe said 12 to 15 minutes. I may be having an issue with my oven, but mine took about 19 minutes. I looked at 12, it wasn't done. You have, and halfway in between, uh, Take a take a, a spoon or something and mix it around so that everything uh, gets um, on the bottom of the pan. Um, I looked at 15 minutes; it still wasn't done. You want it to be a nice. I'm putting this in the oven. Uh, you want this to be a nice golden color. I made some yesterday. This is the color you want. So, 12 to 20 minutes is you know depending on your oven. All right, so we have the pear. 
We made the sauce to cook the pear and we made the crumbles to put on top of the pear. But I'm not gonna put the dessert together. Now, finish the shakshuk. Everybody with me? Okay. The shakshuk is done. You can see that? Okay. You can see it's soft. Tomatoes are soft. Now you want to turn it off the cooktop. Now you want to put the eggs on. And shakshuka serves, this will serve four people. So you want four or eight eggs, depending on who you're cooking for. So one at a time. And if you see the egg is okay, put it on top. Now I'm gonna do four, and this is gonna be our dinner tonight. I love when I give a cooking class and I'm finished and I give away food, which I haven't been able to do, obviously, during the pandemic. But the one benefit is that now I have dinner. And every time I give a class like this, you know, where I'm prepared for, for dinner, one of the things I love to do is teach children how to crack eggs. They love to do it. And it's always, it's always a real lesson. To show people how to crack an egg. The thing about shack sugar is that you want to cook the egg, but leave the yolk a little runny so that it breaks into the vegetable. So you see that I put the eggs in, in the shack sugar, and I see this is a little wobbly. It's either my cooktop or, or my island. But we're going to let the eggs cook for a couple of minutes. And then I can show you how to uh, serve it. In the meantime, in my version of Chef Stuga, we're going to have some mint and some parsley. They got a little forlorn because I took them out this morning. However, um, I'm just going to chop some fresh parsley. It doesn't matter what kind, it could be Italian parsley, which I prefer, I just like the look of it, um, and the curl or curly parsley, it doesn't matter. But this is going to give you a nice green color and some mint. Just want to get about two tablespoons of mint. I had mint growing all over my garden this summer. I couldn't, it was starting to strangle all my other plants, but of course it's winter and when I took the herbs inside, they all died. And getting fresh herbs, fresh mint in this part has proved to be a challenge. So I couldn't get a whole bunch of fresh mint, like, you know, parsley. I had to get one of those little, little packages. It wasn't that much. So this will have to do. And as soon as the eggs are cooked to the way that we like them, almost. I'm gonna move this a little because it's my, it's this cooktop seems to be at an angle. I'm just gonna move that egg a little bit so it gets cooked. This is like a, a poached egg, but the egg is poached um, in, in the vegetable stew. So once this is done, shakshuk is nice with pita bread, 
this because it's Indian style, I would say use non if you could get it non bread, uh, which is also a flat bread. And yeah, almost done. So I'm going to say this one's done. To serve it, take some of the vegetables. And put the egg on top. A little parsley. Whoops. A little mint. And there's dinner or brunch. Now, by the time we eat it, the egg, you know, will be a little hard, but that's okay. This is what it's supposed to look like. So we're going to get to dessert. And before that, any questions on the shakshuka? Good. Is the pear that I um, roasted this morning. It looks a little the worse for wear. I don't know what happened, but I mean, it's okay, but you can see that it's starting to brown. So ordinarily, I would say, cut your pear and maybe separate it. Put it on a serving plate. I happen to make some whipped cream ahead of time. So let's put this slightly off center and have a blob of whipped cream. And some of these crumbles. So put some on the pear and on the whipped cream. And this is one way to serve this dessert. Also, and you would put this, sorry, you could put some of the sauce on it. Um, I don't have much sauce left, but certainly, you know, dress it up a little. However, because this pear doesn't look so good, I had an idea to get a Irish coffee glass or any kind of glass. Take your pear and cut it into bite-sized pieces. And put some in the bottom of the glass. And then add some whipped cream. And then add some crumbles. And then add some more pear and some more whipped cream. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and some more crumbles. So it looks like this. No one ever knows that you did it because the pear didn't look so good. I have done this so many times when fruit didn't come out perfectly and everybody says, oh, part day. So there you go. I have my dinner, I have my dessert and it's exactly finished on time. So if you have a question for me, you know, let me know.
Hi, everybody. Um, everybody, you can unmute yourselves if you'd like, so we can say hello. Um, thank you. I think did anybody's questions because there was a, a little period of inst instability with the um, for a couple of people. So, does anybody else have a question they'd like to raise their hand and unmute themselves and ask? Yes, Lorraine. Um, Ronnie, I had a question about fresh garlic. Do you ever freeze it? Um, wait a no. minute. Fresh ginger. Sorry. Fresh ginger? ginger? I don't. I don't like the texture once it's frozen. I know people do. Mm -hmm. um, I always have a knob of ginger. As I mentioned, you know, I wrap it up in... Um, a towel, and then I put it in one of those dasher bags. <laughs> and it really keeps, it really keeps, I would say, I have, I have ginger for three weeks. When That's a long time. Same. So there's no reason to freeze it. Great. Thank you. Okay. I can't wait to eat. <laughs> okay. Um, I wish I could say I'll be right over. Um, <laughs> I did take a lot of notes, always, there's always notes beyond the, the recipe. So thank you so much, Ronnie, this was great. Um, I've got the cookbook here and Ronnie's cookbooks are available on Amazon. And um, you can go to her, uh, her website and her blog, et cetera. I hope that you will, I hope you will do that. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed this as much as we all did, Ronnie. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to do this. I have fun. I wish I could give out the food. I know. Well, we'll get you back another <laughs> time when, when we can get out the food. We'll get you at the, to the JCC to do with this in person. Um, well, you know, one more question. Oh, okay. Yes. I saw it listed on the chat. So I, I and I had the same question. And that is, this is Gail. Um, oh, hi, Gail. What, would, what did she put in the brown sugar to keep it soft? Oh, let me show you. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I couldn't see all that in the chat. I apologize. I forgot where I bought it, but probably on Amazon. One of these little brick things. You soak it in water, and then you wipe it off, obviously, and you put it in brown sugar, and it never, it never fails. Never. Um, I have, I have a seven-pound bag of sugar that's I have for a long time. It's, it's, and you just push it right in, and of course. It's in a plastic bag, but then I put it in another plastic bag too. So then there's another another trick that I had heard of is that you put an apple into the brown sugar well, and put it in the microwave. That's it. If it's already hard, I've done that. Right. But that's Thank after you. it's hard. Good. It's okay. Amazing. Excellent. That's magnificent. Yeah, terrific. Um, okay, so it was great to see everybody. At least it's sunny outside it, and it feels warm in here watching the cooking, so. Beautiful, um, beautiful out here. Yeah, so um, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, let you know a couple of things that are coming up um, this Sunday on the 21st in uh, recognition of Black History Month. Um, we're sponsoring with a variety of other organizations, uh, Shared Legacies. And um, the movie, it, it, it's a movie that you'll be able to stream. You can register, you can see it on Facebook um, and uh, you'll be able to see the movie starting, I think on the 19th. Um, and uh, then there's gonna be a Q and A afterwards with um, local uh, dignitaries, uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Christie, Rabbi Hammerman, uh, Sherry Rogers, who's the director and producer of the film, uh, Reverend Michael Hyman, uh, who uh, is with uh, Domus? He's and um, it's going to be moderated by Reverend uh, Dr. Stephen Pope, who is the vice chair of the Westchester Human Rights Commission. This is extremely little for me to read, so I'm sorry I'm not looking at the camera. <laughs> and uh, um, and then afterwards, we're also going to have some here's some local stories um, uh, about the civil rights. Um, movement, including Rabbi Philip Schechter and um, Mother Blanche Sumter. So I wanted to let you know about that. And while we're speaking about food, um, I know we haven't even gotten to Purim yet, but Passover is coming up at the end of March. 
and um, we are um, having uh, a couple of food drives, one starting, one this Thursday, which is the, uh, the 18th from 11.30 to one outside the JCC if the weather cooperates and one on the 23rd and we're actually collecting um, kosher macaroons for um, Jewish family service to put together for their Passover um, bags that, that they give out to, I believe it's over 250 families. So if you're so inclined and you wanna drop by and bring some Manischewitz or Streitz or whatever is your favorite brand of kosher macaroons and drop them off, that would be great. We'll also take gift cards to you know, stop and shop or, or, or shop right wherever they can get kosher food. And uh, so I wanted to let you know about that and just keep on looking at our Facebook page and, and the website and you'll see all the events that are coming up. And um, great to see you on Zoom. Hope to see you in person soon. Take Thank care. You.